Hello everyone, welcome to uh, the role of the Energy Independent Farm in meeting the COP26 Methane Pledge session. Um, it's certainly a session that I find um, very exciting. I'm really, really interested in, in this session and sort of there's been a lot of discussions today in various talks. Um, we had our, our farmers breakfast earlier this morning and there's a lot of discussions really now around small on-farm biogas and, and the role that, that sort of smaller solutions and the impact and the large scale impact that they can have. Um, I think it's one that's of particular relevance in today's climate in terms of the issues that farmers are facing. There's a lot of headwinds um, from fer rising fertilizer costs, energy costs, and demand for cheaper products. Uh, and on top of that, I think it's really, really important that, that the agriculture sector really um, reduces its greenhouse gas emissions if it's going to remain viable in a decarbonized world. So um, I think so far to date, I don't think there's been a significant amount of progress in the decarbonization space in agriculture. And I know it's one that often gets a lot of uh, sometimes bad press, sometimes not. Um, but it's a really great, I think it, there's a lot of opportunity for innovation. And that's really what um, today's session is about. Um, I think just one thing to note is uh, a couple of years ago, McKinsey published a, uh, a paper that sort of noted that replacing tractors and combine harvesters that rely on fossil fuels will be one of, uh, with zero emission solutions, will be one of the most um, significant um, measures that can be implemented within the agri-food industry to help drive change. And uh, back when that when that report was published. Um, the paper noted that actually there wasn't anything commercially available within that space at the time. Um, and so it's really exciting to be able to stand here and say that sort of in 2023 now we've got the world's first biomethane powered energy independent farm um, being delivered by, by Benemans uh, in partnership with New Holland. And that's who we've got here, here with us today. Um, so I'm not going to go on for too much longer, but I just want to introduce today's speakers. So we've got Dr. Chris Mann who is co-founder and chief technical officer at Benemon, and Gilles Mayer, who is global head of alternative fuel product management at New Holland. Um, so just as a brief introduction, uh, Dr. Chris Mann is obviously the co-founder and CTO of Benemon. He is an applied physicist um, in from his early days, uh, spending a large portion of the early part of his career working in the space sector, developing sensors. Uh, so from space to biogas, uh, using his previous knowledge and his passion for the environment, he co-founded Benemans um, to commercialize a highly innovative non-venting liquid methane storage system. Um, so he, today he's joined by Gilles Meyer, who is going to be talking about how he helps Benemans embed the development of clean fuel tech within their solutions. Um, and this talk will really explore the role in the global expansion of biomethane powered energy independent farming. So over to you both. Hello, is this working? Yes. Yeah. Good afternoon, everybody. Very happy to be with you, Chris, Gilles. Um, so I'm going to start uh, <laughs> with the honor uh, of the getting through this. So basically, is this working? So where do I point it? There, here. Next slide. Um, okay. So as Leanne started to say, in fact, when we look at the European responsibility of CO2 emissions very broadly, basically the ag is responsible for 10% of the CO2 emissions and the machinery, in fact, is only responsible for 1%. But that doesn't stop us as uh, New Holland. In fact, we took at the 11% as a global mission to take our contribution to redu reducing the CO2 emission. So this is where our proposed circular economy, uh, independent farm, comes in uh, with the both ag and machinery contribution. What, where we are is that uh, New Holland is a large scale um, machinery around the world, uh, quite transversal machinery producer. And we have put on the market the first T6 180 methane, which is just behind the, uh, the, on our stand just behind the tent. And this is running on 100% natural gas, but also biogas, which is the most important in bringing us here. Uh, we have done that, and we understood when meeting Chris and his team 
in two a little bit more than 2001, 21, but we took a minority stake into the company because we really be believed that the equation of Benjamin plus New Holland was getting us into a way to getting the 11% uh, target, um, let's say, as a, as a goal. And uh, we took no longer than uh, last month a majority share into the company because we <laughs> found the proof, the evidence that we were going on the right track together and Chris is developing something incredible and, uh, and, um, and so, so be it. So Benjamin is, uh, I'm talking for you here, <laughs> but maybe you can take over, but uh, is an uh, innovate, very innovative and very young company. It's, uh, it was 20 people last year, it's tw 40 already on the way to 50, so it's an increasing uh, startup, let's say, in the UK in the field of innovation and in the production process and storage of uh, methane, compressed or liquid as we said. Um, and in Cornwall you have already established six farms which are running operations today with the system that we're going to describe a little bit later. So together with this combined technology, in fact we bring a livestock fa uh, farmer a real solution for carbon neutrality but even to be a negative footprint in terms of CO2. So in fact, they can start compensating the household uh, footprint in the market with a scalable, it's very important, scalable. That means that it, the uh, investment and the size of the uh, machine, the, the devices we're talking about are very much adaptable. It's going to be mobile, can be shared among different farmers and it's profitable for them. So the, we're talking about here the CO2 reduction, but for the livestock, it's gonna be also a way to stabilize and reduce their costs. So we're really virtual in terms of the interest for the farmer to do both, get a better stability on their costs, therefore profitability, sometimes bring additional revenue, and also become a negative carbon footprint participation for the, let's say, the society. Want to take over, Joe? Yes, go ahead. Screen then. Um, <coughs> so the way the system works is that we, we use the grass from the farm that's already there. Um, the grass is eaten by the livestock, so the livestock are able to absorb much of the energy that's in the grass. But a lot of that energy, roughly a half to you know a third to half, ends up in the slurry in the manure that ends up in a lagoon. And we'll show you a little video of what an uncovered lagoon looks like later in the talk. Where Benjamin has been really innovative is that we've been able to break down the process of upgrading the gas into steps. And we've also been able to introduce a significant amount of energy storage on the farm in the form of biogas that hasn't been, that hasn't been processed. In terms of the, in capturing the methane, the methane by far, as you'll see in a little while, um, dominates the carbon footprint of a dairy farm. And that, is split into two areas. One is the methane from the, the breath of the cow, which we're not doing anything about at the moment. But majority, and this has recently really only just been recognized, the majority is coming from the manure stores and the slurry stores. So when we capture the methane from the lagoon, even if we were to just flare it, we would get a 60% reduction in the carbon footprint of the farm. And that's really important to understand. But instead of flaring it, what we do is we borrow it for a little while, we do something useful with it, like power tractor or power generator, replacing the fossil fuels. And that gives a further carbon benefit. But the main benefit comes from capturing the methane. We've broken down the process into taking the raw biogas, which is really nasty. It's got hydrogen sulfide, it's got um, water vapor in it, as well as the methane and CO2. We clean it and we store it under a cover. And when that cover's full, or when we've got a customer that needs the energy, we send a mobile processing plant to the site and we process that gas in around about a day. It can take a week's worth of gas in a day. And that means that we can share that equipment cost across a number of small farms. If it's a large farm, it could be positioned there for 24 hours a day. So Bannerman's whole role is to just capture as much of that methane as possible and process as much of that methane as possible. Once it's into liquid fugitive methane um, condition, it then qualifies for a subsidy in across Europe. It's various different guises, but the, in the U UK, it's the renewable transport fuel obligation. And that means that we can claim fuel or money back on behalf of the farmer from the transport industry. 
And that subsidy is worth way more than any other subsidy that you'll come across up till now with methane. It also means, more importantly, that that fuel can be used in a mass-produced vehicle, so a tractor, a truck, or mass-produced generator with very high efficiency. And because they're mass-produced, the cost of that equipment is much lower than your traditional CHP biogas engine. The other thing we've been able to do is make sure that we try and use as much of the fuel on site because that means we haven't got to move it off site. Benjamin's an energy company. We take the energy, we collect it, move it into other areas, sell it to customers. And if we can use that fuel on site, we can still claim the subsidy if it's fueling a tractor or a generator. But now we save on logistics costs. And typically, Trinance Farm, would, you'll see in a second, um, we use about two thirds of its energy in the tractor and then on the generator. And the rest of it, we'll actually, we're actually fueling trucks for the local county. This provides fuel for the tractor, so all the power for the tractor, but also the fuel and heat for the farm. So there's a lot of waste heat used on the farm as well. And then finally, the CO2 that comes out of the engine, as I said, we borrowed that methane for a little while, the CO2 and the water vapor that comes out of the exhaust, goes back into the environment and is reabsorbed by um, the next round of grass. Next slide. Yep. So in a nutshell, in fact, what is important to capture is that we have on the right, the CO2 reduction on farm. On the bottom, we're going to, so we're in fact capturing the energy that we're going to take from this farm. On the bottom, we're going to transform and produce the energy. And on the top left, we're going to use this energy back. So everything is happening on site. There's no logistics around in, in, a, virtu in a perfect world. That means there, in, in case there's no excess of production, for instance, if there's excess of production, that's another matter. But basically, everything happens on farm. The source is there, the production is there, and the consu uh, uh, consumption sorry, is there. So the, the we're going to give you the example of the Trenans Farms, uh, Chris, sorry to mention, which is in Cornwall, so southwest of where we are from Birmingham. And the results would be? Yeah, so I'd like to um, take this opportunity to announce the results, which uh, we were only grant were given last last week. Uh, these are independent results from the farm carbon toolkit for Trinance, who've been monitoring the carbon footprint of Trinance Farm now for two years. So prior to uh, last year, the carbon footprint of Trinance Farm, which was actually already very efficient, was 800 tons. See in the top, by capturing the methane and using that methane on site, um, and we've basically reduced the carbon footprint to 87 tonnes from 800. So this year, the probably Trinance Farm is the lowest carbon footprint farm in dairy farm in the world, we suspect. Um, this doesn't include the actual fuel savings from the tractor or from the electricity or from the offset in renewable, um, in, in artificial fertiliser. It does include around, sorry, just about minus 45 tonnes from plants. Um, in, in the form of planting hedges and trees, and also other 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 benefits that the Kevin and Katie have done, and we fully expect next year that this car, this farm will go negative because what we'll do then is we'll have a whole year's usage of fuel on site, energy on site, carbon sequestration, and we expect the saving in fertilizer to be even further. Okay. Sure. So. And uh, not only the, uh, the, sorry, the fertilizer, but you can see that we're going to have the electricity, which replaces the electricity bill, which has been going so high uh, across the world, but in UK most particularly. Uh, we have the disappearance of, uh, of uh, some of the nutrients in the, uh, in the fertilizer per, uh, purchasing. We also recuperate water, drinking water for the cows. And of course, you're capable of reducing um, the, the, the fuel needed for the tractors, but also the number of rounds for the slurry spreading into the, gr into the, into the, um, into the fields. Not only because it's less wet and the efficiency of the fertilizer, the um, organic fertilizer is much better quality, but also adding with the technology on board the tractor, I'm going to come with it to in a second, allows that. So no more stirring before, no more, no more, uh, I mean, uh, an immense uh, quantity of time spent and energy uh, doing spreading, which uh, are coming less. 
Um, and on top of that, since you're, bu you're, you're producing like, uh, electricity, then you can run your electricity scraper, your uh, electricity tractor, your electricity mini excavator on the farm, whatever your machinery, so the fuel disappears, let's say the diesel disappears. Uh, now, why on the machine, on the tractor, it's becoming, uh, um, let's say we, we chose methane, is that we really think, and the whole thing about ag plus machinery comes in very, uh, makes very sense here, is that we think about well to wheel. That means not only the energy coming out of the engine, but where the energy is coming from. So when you're looking just by bio, um, fugitive methane, bio from liquid manure, in fact, you look at the um, CO2 coming out of the machine and you see that with the bio, tra uh, the, the T6 methane, you're not only close to zero, you're way, way negative that you see on the left. So you can compare to hydrogen, you can compare to electricity, whatever. The fact is that this tractor is really taking away the methane 86 times more harmful than CO2 over 20 years. You're taking away that from the atmosphere and releasing something less pollutant than diesel or whatever. So this is where it comes in very virtual and the necessity of uh, the, the, you do the real added value of having a, a methane tractor. And on top of that, we demonstrated with this tractor that the performance are very equal to the diesel, so there's no, there's no uh, let's say, a loss in terms of ability for the farmer to do the job. On top of that, what we add with the technology on tractors, and this is not specific to New Holland, but we carry it on board with the technology, is the precision land management that allows us it to be a lot more precise and reduce the uh, field work in terms of quantity because we are in a surgery, sorry, surgery uh, mode, let's say, uh, my English uh, pronunciation is a little bit difficult there, but let mean that we're going to only spread what we need where we need it in terms of fertilizer or whatever product. And, uh, uh, and also we, are with we can add near sensors and, but, and the IoT from which the Benjamin team also has a fantastic uh, background on is going to help us really work distance uh, on the optimization in the field. And on top of that, uh, tomorrow we're going to drive the ability of finding the fuel um, for the tractor where it is, uh, where there's availability of uh, methane, where uh, the farmer has his storage. So if we, if we look at a typical farm, uh, we use this generic farm of 150 cow um, unit, which is a sort of an average size for the farm. We remove the um, methane emissions from the slurry. We remove the carbon emissions or CO2 emissions from the generation of heat or the use of fuel. We also remove a big chunk of the um, artificial fertilizer, and I should say that's actually higher now. And we also remove um, a lot of the transport costs for all of the inputs to the farm. What's left is the enteric emissions, so that's the, the breath from the cow. Um, that, that's a fa fairly big chunk, but that is now being offset on Trinance through the use of carbon sequestration through both hedges uh, and also through the ground and woodland that's implanted. So roughly it's one cow takes one house off grid. So 150 here cow will take roughly 140 UK household car carbon footprints off grid. Bear in mind there's eight and a half thousand dairy farms in the UK. So in terms of reaching that methane pledge, which is what we're talking about in a second, um, this has a huge impact on the ability of the UK. Up until now, there's been no way of reducing, significantly reducing the methane impact on agriculture. So what Benjamin's offering with, with New Holland is uh, three, oh, do you want to go back one, Gilles, just so I can talk about it? I can't. Oh, you can't. Okay. Oh, yes, I can. Yeah, so <laughs> as far as we're concerned at Benjamin, um, we don't care. Once that fire gas is available, either through uh, a concrete store or through an open lagoon or a, a tower, once that gas has been captured and cleaned and stored, we don't really care. The rest of the equipment and the service is the same. I should say that the farmer does absolutely nothing, really. He puts his slurry into the same equipment. Uh, from then on, Benjamin takes control of it. We hold the environment agency permit. We monetize the, the sale of the gas, and then we share that profit with the farmer. Just to give you an idea of what a real lagoon looks like, I took this one. This is my world record largest biogas boil from a lagoon in Cornwall in February this year. 
Bear in mind, off to the right, there's a similar size boil going on. This lagoon's been there for 20 years. There's a sediment on the bottom, probably two meters deep of uh, the solid material. That's probably about 10 cubic meters of biogas coming off that one boil. And on a daily basis, um, probably losing, you know, in terms of actual methane value, hundreds of pounds. So this is this kind of option where we're looking at retrofitting on a floating mattress cover, which I think we have, we have pictures of that in the engine? Uh, that's coming just after yeah, that. Yeah, so obviously we want to get things to market quick. We want to capture market as quickly as possible. So what we've, we've demonstrated is the full system with this gas stored in it. And what we're now putting into, um, into the field is this retrofitable system. As you can see here, it goes onto an existing lagoon and it has the ability to either store gas off of the lagoon or actually on the cover. The key thing about this is that we can store about a week's worth of gas gained, the dirty gas off, it's been cleaned, and use the processing system in a day and share that cost across the whole site. So this will be going live on a farm in North Devon uh, in the summer. It's part of the Time CO2 uh, uh, project, which is looking for technologies which can dramatically impact climate change. And it does dramatically impact climate change because when you capture one kilo of methane, that's the same as taking 27 kilos of methane out of the atmosphere over 100 years or 80 kilos of, sorry, 27 kilos of CO2 out of the atmosphere or 87 kilos of methane out of the atmosphere over a 20 year period. And most climate scientists now believe the next 20 years are absolutely critical for us. So. so uh, no, go, 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 go. So, so in terms of the benefits, I won't run through them all because you could, we've been through them. Increased profitability, the farmer's making dramatic savings in his, in his running costs. He's also gaining his independence, he has complete stability, he knows what his fuel is going to cost him because he's making it. So we typically we offer fixed price buybacks of his own fuel uh, for five years. And then on top of that you have all of the environmental benefits, I won't run through them, but massive one is actually retention of ammonia and N2O as well as minimizing slurry runoff. In fact, there's no slurry runoff from our farms now. And also gives the opportunity to improve the health of the farm. Coming along, there will be a hybrid gen set in a couple of years' time. And I think there's also a mention of a liquid, special liquid tractor in a second. I think there's a little video to play. Okay. So um, if we think about 110,000 10, dairy livestock farms across Europe, if we just take 10% market share, that means that per year we're going to take away 20 million tons of CO2 just with this solution. So when we talk about the methane pledge, we're talking about reducing by one third by uh, 2030. Here we're bringing a solution that in fact is going to take 100% away from the farm that's going to implement that. So that's what, the, that's what we need to take away while improving the profitability of the farmer. So we're very enthusiastic about this solution and we want to develop it. So we, we are looking into finding another few farms in the UK for 2023 to validate the whole process, but we're running on the market 2024 uh, to develop that as soon as possible. So any help, any support, any farmer interested is more than welcome. And of course, we will come later with the uh, liquid solution, um, also in terms of Benjamin installation, but also on the tractors, as we saw maybe on the tech days that were very uh, widely um, spread out on the on the uh, social media. So just to, to finish, I want to show, share a video on the two together, what it looks like.
So thank you very much for your attention. If, if you have any questions, of course. Are there any questions from the audience? Um, we've got a couple of minutes left. Um, I guess I'll sit down and take a seat as well. Um, I have one question, I suppose. You, you've spoken very much about the positives and you know the, the carbon emission savings and potential cost paybacks and. I think it, it is very much presented as a no-brainer. So I suppose in terms of getting the business to the next step and, and getting that expansion, um, what sort of perceived barriers are there? Or, or do you think at this point it really is just a case of demonstrating the business case and, and away we go? Um, I think the from, from our perspective, I'm sure she will sort of agree, is that the, the next stage is the most challenging. It's the ramp up. So. Um, I think the total number of livestock farms in the world is uh, just under a million. So if you were to hope that we would, someone, hopefully, uh, hopefully us, um, would get to a point where we can service all of those, if you count back from 2050 and you halve it, it means that within the next few years we need to be deploying systems onto farms at a rate of five to ten a day. Um, and I think that's challenging, but doable, I hope. Jules? Well... <coughs> Uh, I think that, uh, I mean, as you said, there's so much dairy farms. The question is, what will be the drivers for those dairy farms? And I think that large corporations that declare that they want to be um, CO2, uh, let's say, CO2 reduction oriented have to influence also their supply chain. So if you look at the large ag players, uh, they have, they're supposed to have, and they have, for the ones we're speaking to, the intention of driving and showing the possible solutions that are on the market to help them achieve that. Of course, if we bring a solution where they, on top of that, can bring their cost down for the livestock farmer, it's going to be all the best. So when we, and you can see on our tractor, in fact, the, the, the first, uh, the tractor that we have here has been sold to John Lewis. So Wait Rose, for the, uh, uh, for the UK uh, uh, people that are around here will understand that the food chain is very interested into that. So it's very important that not only an, uh, a livestock farmer takes the, uh, let's say, the, innova uh, the uh, initiative to go into that because the investment is also, we don't mention it because the price list is not available, but it's very reasonable to everything, every bio uh, gas plant where we've seen so far. But it's very important that not only them, but also the corporations that their customers, the co-op, uh, the um, cooperatives, uh, the milking companies and so on also push into that direction and we hope also that the governments will take the initiative to favor that one way or the other. The usage of, of biomethane in fact it has to be let's say the, the vehicle for those countries to push uh, in their policies and we see across Europe unfortunately very different ways of adapting a policy. They can have the willingness, the understanding and the money but for the same thing, the way it goes through it is completely different as a result. So it's very difficult from a European perspective so far to have an homogeneous thing. So here, it's, uh, the difficulty is who can help us leverage this and bring this kind of message to develop it uh, in, in a fast way because 2030 is tomorrow, as, as, as uh, we know. I, I can just add one thing to that. I mean, I think the, the consumer plays a huge role in this. Um, just to put the into pers perspective what that means at Trinance Farm is there the carbon footprint per kilogram of milk has dropped from 1.1 kilos to 0.13 kilos. So for the first time, the consumer can look at a pint of milk and go, well, actually, you know, if I buy that pint of milk, I've just taken one kilogram of CO2 out of the environment. Now, is that worth an extra 20 pence a litre? You know, my, my mind is that it's that, that opportunity has never actually been there before because, you know, it would hover around about 1.1, 1.0 kilograms per kilogram of milk. And now you've got milk, which is a tenth of the carbon footprint. And that has to be worth something. Yeah, I completely agree. And green premiums is something that's, that's come up time and time again, I think, over the past sort of few weeks um, in, in my conversations. And I, I think... I know that the sentiment is there from a, a, a market base as well, so I, I completely agree. Um, I think we are actually over time. Um, I'm conscious that we've got, so maybe one question very quickly. I'm looking at my, my manager. Okay, 
Um, this, this person had their hand up first. Sorry. Okay, thank yeah. you uh, for the presentation. So uh, you did emphasize, if I heard you right, that uh, the T6 can run on biogas as well as methane. I wondered if you could explain a bit further. And if I could also ask, is there any issues with retrofitting the existing fleet to uh, methane? No. no, it's not bio. Uh, so if I mention biogas, it's my mistake. Natural gas. Natural gas or biomethane. But uh, it has to be methane, not biogas. We can, run we can still run at 83% content of methane, so it's still quite low, but it's still called methane. Okay. Uh, and the other question behind was? Oh, no. So the retrofit does not exist. The engine technology changes. Uh, so even if the engine stays the same ground as a diesel one, we the modification are really... Uh, difficult and expensive to do on a retrofit, uh, retrofit uh, way. Thank you very much. Uh, yep. There will be time for sort of questions off stage now anyway, so it's, uh, it's just really to prepare for the next session. But thank you so much, everybody, for joining. Um, next session is life cycle assessments, so please stick around for that if you're interested. Thank you.